Has it now got to the point in the Church of England where it will split? Hi, welcome to the channel. My name is Rev Dan Amivica in the Church of England. On this channel you get all my views as a parish priest on all the Christian news happening in the world today. Subscribe to the channel, like the video, comment down below, share it and don't forget to hit that notification bell. Since the papers came out last week for General Synod about what the trajectory of same-sex blessings is going to be, we have been waiting for the reaction of all those who have spoken out before to come out. They have now. If you want to watch the video for my initial reaction of the, the papers, you can watch that here. But now different organisations and bishops have come out to say uh, their dissenting views and what they want to happen uh, going forward. Of course, the first thing we all want to happen is for this to be withdrawn or to be backtracked. We do not want to go down this route, but if it does, as laid out in some of the papers I'm going to read, there's uh, big words uh, are being said, but what does that actually mean for us? So the first letter we're going to look at is from the bishops. Eleven bishops have written their dissenting views to what is happening. Five of them are diocesan bishops, they're the head honcho as it were. And then you've got six suffragan bishops that they work alongside the diocesan bishops. You know, it's, it's great to have these diocesan bishops standing out and saying this. We have to pray for them, but especially for the suffragan bishops, they are... Um, <laughs> They're not diocesan bishops. They don't have the same protections as it were. Uh, a lot of suffragan bishops go on to be diocesan bishops. So by stepping out and saying this is, is, is it's good on them, they are making a stand. And remember, the bishops came out last year uh, after the General Synod's paper was written, put in their dissenting views on there. Got a, a, a lot of people. With, well, thank you very much for standing up. We were waiting for the bishops for a long time last year to come and say something. And now they are saying something. Now we have been waiting for it, but now it is here. So what did they say? We are grateful for the hard work of all those who have contributed towards the latest proposals in the LLF journey. We are painfully conscious of the considerable toll that the journey has taken on many of our churches, and especially our LGBTQI plus and same-sex attracted sisters and brothers. We remain prayerfully aware of our dependence on the God of hope to strengthen us at a time of such deep disagreement, so that we might overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Romans 15.13 However, we are among a number of bishops unable to support the direction of the travel presented to the bishops at our most recent meeting or the proposals to be brought to the General Synod next month. And reading between the lines of everything that was put out in press releases, there had to be uh, dissenting views. Uh, but, you know, if they're going by majority vote, then that's what they're going to say out in the media. But we have been waiting for this to come and now it has come and they say quite rightly we, we cannot in good conscience uh, agree with the direction of travel that it is going in. We welcome the emphasis on the importance of unity but do not believe the proposals will protect our unity in mission to the nation or our partnerships with the wider church. We are persuaded that a commitment to unity will instead be demonstrated by the resolve we show to take time we need to achieve sufficient consensus in relation to doctrinal matters. This is why we continue to call upon our fellow bishops and General Synod not to set aside the proper canonical procedures for considering theological and liturgical developments, which are intended to guard our unity. We regret the plan to reverse the House's October decision, supported by Synod in November, to introduce standalone services by Canon B2. So Canon B2 is the legal way to bring in new liturgy into the Church of England. And Canon B2 means each house, the House of Bishops, the House of Clergy, the House of Laity, has to vote by two-thirds majority for liturgy to be passed. That's all three houses there. And that's the right and proper legal way of being uh, to put new liturgy into the Church of England. What is going to happen, it's going to be recommended by can be five and that means it's going to be commended by the bishops the bishops said go ahead and use it and then it's down to each local vicar incumbent to choose whether to use it by going going through canon b2 there's a legal uh, protection around general synod has said yes we voted on this and we, they go through all the legal loopholes and it's safe to use whether you want to use it or not 
Canon B5 being commended puts the legal emphasis down onto the incumbent being uh, to, to choose to use it and what will more than likely happen is if it goes through this way which is most likely going to happen if a vicar uses that those prayers of love and faith or standalone service they're open to legal challenge and then it will go to court and lawyers and it will cost a lot of money but it will the only way to prove whether they're legal or not we don't know until it goes to court and, and both sides are argued whether it's really legal or not but the proper way this should be done is via canon b2 which is what the house decided uh that well synod sorry decided back in november as uh, the bishops have stated but now that's been reversed while we recognize that general synod voted in november by a small majority to explore new worship services Synod has also committed itself to doing this in a way that does not depart from the doctrine of the church. After much careful and intense work, it seems clear that this, together with changes to the disciplines for clergy in relation to the doctrine of marriage, is not possible without accepting a development that changes doctrine. So you've got here the bishops, the 11 bishops, saying that, yes, we recognise the vote in Synod, and it was a small majority, but, you know, everybody gets voted on there except for the general uh, except for the bishops um and so we have to take that vote if it got voted for it got voted for as much as we disagree you know it's an open and fair process anybody from the clergy and laity can stand for general synod and be elected on there so we have to take it you know that's a democracy in that sense but the work what they voted on needs work and it needs presented properly and if we're talking that it's not a, doctor, a departure from the doctrine of the church of england and now these bishops are saying, look, we can't see that it isn't a departure from the doctrine of the Church of England, that, that, that there's a problem here. So you can't vote on something and say, yeah, we agree that it's not going to be a, do a departure from the doctrine of the Church of England. And then it is, you know, you, th there's just huge problems there. Although it has now been acknowledged that structural change to Episcopal oversight will be required by the proposed development, we believe the significant and extent of these structural changes are not being recognised. Many bishops are already concerned about the impact of coherence of the church's life, of moving ahead in a way that would create fundamental fragmentations at parish, diocesan and national levels. And so this is what has been called for, especially at the CEEC, the Church of England Evangelical Council, of differentiation but the, and structural change. And that isn't going to be given. What they're saying is extended Episcopal oversight. So if you can't agree with your diocesan bishop, then you can go to another bishop, uh, probably even your suffragan bishop as well. What happens if you're suffragan and your diocesan bishop, you can't agree with, you would have to go somewhere else. What happens if you agree with your suffragan bishop but not your diocesan bishop? That's that's a question, or, or vice versa. So that that has to be worked out. But seeing that there's, so if we take this as an example, there's only eleven bishops uh, that most of us would say, you know, I want them as my bishop. You know, that for all the clergy uh, who would look for oversight for these eleven bishops, it would create so much work for them, and. How are they supposed to run their diocese or parts of their diocese, uh, the archdeacon, as we call them, um, when they're trying to help and deal with all these clergy saying, no, I, you know, you're orthodox. I want to come and have you as my Episcopal oversight. But it would also create fragmentation of, as they say, the, the parish, the diocese and uh, at national level. So you've got all these parishes dotted all over the place and this parish wants to go to that bishop or stay with their bishop but this parish wants to go to another bishop who's somewhere else and it create fragmentation and what happens then when they go into vacancy and a, and a, maybe perhaps a, a different vicar with different views comes in and how does that work and the church is used to having a, a the diocesan bishop and then a new vicar comes in says you know changes that and wants to go it creates utter confusion because there isn't differential the structure isn't being absolutely changed uh, and, and recognized it's just being extended and you know and and that doesn't work so there are problems already and the amount of work as i said that's going to go into the bishops will be horrendous we therefore urge synod to rethink the process at this time and request the bishops to enable further doctrinal work bringing back proposals that will be properly can be considered under the governance of the necessary canons we pray that through prayer wise counsel and good process 
we may yet reach a consensus that is recognised as having legitimacy by all parts of the church and enables all to flourish in our shared mission to the nation and beyond. And this is what I said in my last video, that the General Synod have been asked to vote on for something in July and they haven't got the full package. They don't know exactly what they're voting on. What the, the, the House of Bishops is asking is vote on this. We'll spend the next, like... 10 months, 9, 10 months working on all all of this that we should ask you to vote on. We'll then get to Synod next February and we'll implement it. So it's going to happen, but all that work hasn't been done. You know, how can you vote on something which you don't know exactly what you're voting for? You're voting on a paper which has been presented. I, I'm going to go through that in a, a more detailed video to come out soon. And um, and you don't know exactly what you're voting for. They're saying, look, let's hold back. Let's take, let's take time get this all together make sure it goes through the right canons the right doctrinal work is being done and bring back the proposals fully packaged so general synod can make an informed decision at the moment it's just a decision of we want it or we don't want it but there's no it's not going to be an informed decision it's going to be on what they want their preferred we want same-sex blessings in the church of england or we don't want it but there's we don't know what all the people what's going to say and, and they're absolutely right in this take time do all the work before and then vote on it. What, what, why, what's the need to rush? So these are the bishops that have signed it and well done to them and pray for them. We then have the Alliance, which is a, a, a group of a different interested parties in this coming to write, I think, their seventh letter to the archbishops. And they will go further, actually. And uh, so let's get into this letter. Dear Archbishop Justin and Archbishop Stephen, we write as a broad coalition of leaders of networks across different traditions supported by more than 2,000 clergy within the Church of England. We have read the Orthodox Bishop's statement published earlier today and wholeheartedly agree and support them in their endeavours to remain faithful to the Orthodox teaching of the Church of England. We have also seen the proposed agenda for General Synod included GS2358 and note the intention of the House of Bishops to proceed with plans that are clearly contrary to the canons and doctrine of the Church in England, in particular Canon B30, where the Church of England affirms, according to our Lord's teaching, that marriage is in its nature a union permanent and lifelong for better for worse, and death do them part of one man and one woman to the exclusion of all others on either side. What is clearly proposed is clearly indicative of a departure from the doctrine of the Church of England in any essential matter. We have written to you and your colleagues in the House of Bishops on several occasions, setting out the unintended consequences of these moves that you propose and the issues they raise in terms of Western elitism, ignoring the views of the Global South and unlawfulness, failing to follow the canons of the Church of England which are designed to preserve unity. So a couple of things here. They talk about the departure of the Doctrine of England in any essential matter, which is what the, the House of Bishops have been using instead of just a departure of the Doctrine of the Church of England. They've added any in any essential matter. And they're saying, well, you might have added that in a way, but it still is a departure of the Doctrine of England in any essential matter. So they're, they're pointing that out to them and saying, we've written to you on several occasions and there's unintended consequences and that's because we're part of a worldwide church the anglican church is worldwide and it is ignoring the global south where they are well orthodox and they're also not following the laws set out in the canons of the church of england by preserving unity in the church and you have to say at the moment the church is not unified at all it's probably the most divided well since i've become a priest it's this is the most divided it's been but it's calls for general synod and the house of bishops that's what they the oath they take it that's the house of bishops as as bishops to keep unity within the church and this hasn't as you know we have always urged that general synod be allowed to follow correct legal processes requiring two-thirds majority in all houses for a change of liturgy it is a deep matter of regret and the cause of incalculable damage to the structure integrity and mission of the national church that the house of bishops having agreed in october 2023 and in november 2023 with the whole synod that the correct canonical process be followed has reneged on that decision and that, as a result, no such process has begun. And, as I said before, B2 was a proper legal process. And for the House of Bishops to say, no, we're not going to follow that. We're going to put it through B5 and commend these prayers. After it was agreed 
you could see the trust of the House of Bishops. The trust of the House of Bishops, and as I said in previous videos last year, is at an all-time low. And there's such talk of abuse of power that, again, this will be seen as an abuse of power. There's a canonical uh, process that has been set out for the General Synod to follow, and that is not being followed. So, you know, as a parish level, both clergy and laity, how are we going to see that? What are we going to see? We're going to see, we're going to say that, you know, why aren't you following process? Why are you doing it this way? Given this, we want to inform you that we are now proposing a positive way forward to allow those churches who support the church's teaching to carry on their mission and pipeline of ministry securely founded on the church's doctrine. If the further departure from the church's doctrine suggested by the Synod Papers does go ahead, we'll have no choice but rapidly to establish what would be, in effect, a new de facto parallel province within the Church of England and to seek pastoral oversight from bishops who remain faithful to orthodox teaching on marriage and sexuality. We will encourage all church leaders who are in sympathy with the Alliance to join the parallel province. So that's huge. What's been asked for by the CEEC is a third province. So you've got the province of York and the province of Canterbury and they're saying, let us have a third province that is for Orthodox. You know, the Orthodox are not leaving the teachings that are handed down to us, the doctrine of the Church of England, which we have inherited since the formation of the Church of England as we know it uh, since the Reformation. We are staying with that, but we will go into a third province. That hasn't been given. That's a structural differentiation that was asked for. So what the Alliance is now saying is we'll, we'll, we'll create our own. And remember in London, they created their, uh, their own deanery in the, the city of London deanery. It's not recognised as its own deanery. It's got its own structures, its own people, its own way of doing things. It's not recognised by the Church of England, but they are doing it anyway. And it feels like this is what's going to happen. I do not know legally how this would work. How um, if I or any other Orthodox clergy said, right, you have now gone too far. You want to do same-sex blessings and standalone services and um, allow same-sex clergy to enter into civil unions. I will now want to join this. I have no idea because the bishop, the diocese of bishop is still your bishop. They give you the license or, or the suffragan bishop. You, you, you swear a can, can, canonical oath to the bishop's office. Uh, you, they've got involved with safeguarding and, 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 and there's just things that are, are so linked with the diocese and bishops how this will actually work now I know the alliance has got their own lawyers and they've looked at all this so this would have to be uh, explained further uh, but it's a huge statement we are going to set up our own province and we're going to invite local incumbents to come and be part of that province and we're then going to look for um, uh, pastoral oversight spiritual oversight for those incumbents from bishops who remain faithful to the orthodox teaching of marriage and sexuality in, in a different way not the way that the, the church of england and the bishops are suggesting at general synod uh, with uh, that extended oversight but in, in a new way um, I, I don't know how this would work but i know the work that has been uh, done and i can only imagine since this has come out there's lots of lawyers running around everywhere looking at all these things so it'd be interesting to see how this works we will take action with immediate effect to open up a new pre-ordination stream for potential ordinance in partnership with orthodox bishops to reverse the decline caused in part by this unconstitutional and unorthodox process so they're not holding back uh, in their words now. Well, how can they? Really not, because this is going to General Synod. It will more than likely pass. And of course, they're, they're saying now what it is and how they feel. It's unconstitutional and it's an unorthodox process. When, again, and it's, you have to just go over perhaps my videos or look at what's happened over General Synod over the past year. It is a process that's not really been followed properly if this wasn't perhaps same-sex blessings and living in love and faith and, and on something else the process would have been followed in the normal way so the question is why has the process not been followed in in this way so they are now saying we're going to set up a new pre-ordination stream for potential ordinance again i don't know how that would work exactly we'll wait for that to come through and how they 
would go to train and, and get their curacies, especially because um, it's uh, it's working with the bishop of the diocese as well. And that goes back to the clergy, really. Uh, we, we hold the license from the bishop and we work with the bishop um, for the cure of souls of the places that we are in. And, and, and what does what does that look like? It, um, this is a lot of questions for me, but uh, I, I know the work has been done, so it'd be interesting to see how that works and and the pushback on this as well the pushback how many clergy will feel that they would join this new province and and what's going to be the pushback and, and what would happen to those clergy who decide to do that we are not leaving the church of england or the anglican communion we wish to stay loyal to the one holy catholic and apostolic church throughout the world rather than be part of a schismatic move which departs from the teaching received and upheld not only by the vast majority of the anglican communion representing around 75% of the Anglican Communion's 80 million members, the Roman Catholic Church, the Orthodox Churches, but also the vast majority of churches around the world. The new province will seek to cooperate with other Orthodox provinces within the Anglican Communion. We believe that this positive way forward will allow the Orthodox Churches within the Church of England to grow and flourish and raise up ordinance, reversing the considerable fall since the House of Bishops' PLF proposals and encourage a re-evangelism of our nation. And that is one thing, the ordinance coming through has seen a massive decline. But there is one question here that, you know, they talk about Orthodox. Not all clergy are in churches and parishes that are Orthodox. You might have Orthodox clergy. But the, the parishes are very split over this. So what does that look like, when, especially in the countryside and in smaller churches? What does that look like How, for those churches? Because the, the talk about churches here, but not all churches would feel that they could join the Alliance's new province, uh, but the, the incumbent might really want to. So you've got the incumbent uh, looking for new spiritual and pastoral oversight from the province, but the church is absolutely dead against it. Again, a lot of questions are very early uh, in this, and all this, I suppose, will come out, but... Um, that will create division at a, a, a local level as well and, and, and very much push back from um, the church and the incumbent. And it could be vice versa. Maybe the, the church wants to join the new province, but the incumbent doesn't. So division, 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 more division. We urge you, even at this late stage, to honour your oath as archbishops and bishops in England and to follow the lawful constitutional path to preserve the unity of the church throughout the Anglican Communion. And it is, the, the whole Anglican Communion is looking in and, and seeing how this process is going through and saying, you're not following your own rules, the, the constitution that you have. You're, you're doing this in a way that is, is not right. And so we've got to remember, we're not just uh, the Church of England. We are within the Anglican Communion, which is, is, is huge, as I said, 80 million members. And it, if what we do here in the Church of England will affect our relationship, and it already has, uh, with the the Anglican Communion saying, uh, well, 75% of the Anglican Communion saying we don't recognise the Archbishop of Canterbury as the first among equals, uh, in the sense of the leader um, of the Anglican Communion. That's the first time in its history. It's unprecedented. And now you've got some uh, churches and countries saying they are not uh, in communion with the church of england anymore which is hugely sad and they say the trajectory you're going on we, we cannot be in communion unless things change and remember the the anglican communion is now being reimagined uh, and, and who will be the first among equals now and, and how that will all work but all of that has come out of this process that is happening in the church of england so we can see here different i would say different groups that assigned it but it's not the groups it's the individuals assigned it they are part of that group as but they stay stay at the bottom that they're signing in their personal capacity and it might not represent the views of the whole group. So you've got um, UK government majority reps, uh, archdeacons, New Wine, uh, HDB networks, evangelical group on General Synod, um, the CEEC, Renew, um, church planting, female Orthodox female group, living out group, uh, and church society. So they are signing in their own capacities, but this. The alliance has formed uh, because of the reaction uh, to uh, LLF. But not on the signatory this time is uh, forward in faith and the society.
the Anglo Catholic side. And so that's an interesting bit. We're going to get into the reason why they're not on because they released their statements as well. So it's very much an evangelical side who are signing this letter to the archbishops. But the Anglo Catholic side, they feel that they've already got their own settlement in place. So the Society under the patronage of St. Wilfred and St. Hilda say, Together, let us call upon the Holy Spirit for the gifts of wisdom, patience, and humility, especially in the discussion of LLF. This complex matter has intensified the need for serious consideration of the theological work already being done by the Faith and Order Commission of the House of Bishops and subsequently of the implications of that work for doctrine and ecclesiastical law which are essential for the church's mission. Again, reiterating the support of what the Alliance has written, we recognise the toll that is taken on our GPTQI plus Christians who are strongly present in so many of the parishes we have been formed in and now serve. We also register and share significant and growing disquiet among um, evangelical brothers and sisters whose vitality enriches our partnership in the gospel. The Church of England has made bold claims for the LLF journey. General Synod has discovered that the LLF timetable and its possible outcomes are more complex than have been expected. This is a journey of discernment that is taking longer than anyone could have anticipated. Its outcome cannot be be predetermined which interesting words at the end its outcome cannot be predetermined but it definitely feels like it is being predetermined um and it has taken a long time it it does but i i really believe on something like this it needs to take longer as bishops of the society we continue to reflect and take counsel with our clergy who share in our ministry as guardians of the sacraments as teachers of the faith and as those called to exercise oversight of the people of god committed to our care May God, who sent us the light of his Holy Spirit, grant us to have a right judgment in all things evermore to rejoice in his holy comfort. And signed by all the bishops of the society. And our forwarded faith, part of uh, the anglo Catholic movement, have said, and, and this is a reason why they didn't sign the Alliance's letter, because they have their own settlement. They say, as we have our own settlement dating back to 2014, and benefit from the Episcopal provision which goes with that settlement, it would not be appropriate for us to sign the Alliance's letter of today's date. For the avoidance of doubt, we want to make clear, via this short statement, our wholehearted support for the Society Bishop Statement of today, which I just read, the statement the 11 Church of England bishops of today's date, expressing concerns about the LLF process, which we read before, a statement to be reached with all those who cannot in good conscience go along with the developments being proposed which are starting to be put in place through the LLF process, signed by these three people. So because for the faith and and, and the Anglo-Catholic brothers there, they had the provision back in 2014 because of uh, they cannot support or or recognise women priests and bishops, well later on bishops when bishops came in, uh, they have their, in a sense, their own structures which they're going to use for the LLF process that there, there's questions about that anyway but they, they they stand in unity with the bishops who have done the statement and with the alliance's letter but they say we're going to work on our own provision so if you notice on all that all these statements came out on the same day so you can know that they're working with each other they're, they're, they're sending these things across but this is actually huge all coming out on the same day as well this is actually huge this is saying to the bishops and general synod and the archbishops do not go this way. Everything is going to change now. And I think that with the alliance, it's going to happen quite quickly. I think things have been prepared for over months and months and months. And, and, and don't forget, when General Synod votes on this uh, next week, once it's voted for, it's going to happen. It might take another year for some things to happen as they come back to General Synod. But uh, it will happen. And we will see standalone uh, same sex blessings happening uh, this year. And so once that line has been crossed, as it were, once that vote goes through, and if it does go through, which, as I said, it's more likely that it will go through, then we'll see things happening and we will uh, we'll see exactly what the detail of that is. But again and again, there's things that are unprecedented that are happening, as I said before, with the archbishop not being recognized uh, the archbishop of canterbury not being recognized the first amongst equals provinces out there not being in communion with the church of england anymore for bishops to come out and speak out against the house of bishops which they are part of or the college bishops in such a way 
we've seen things unprecedented, let alone all the processes that have either not been followed or legal work that has not been given to General Synod or asking General Synod to vote on things which they have not yet seen fully. It's the whole of this process for Al Al F has, has, has divided the church nationally and internationally uh, more than anybody could ever have ima imagined. But it's also damaged the reputation and the trust, not only in um, the House of Bishops, which has been clearly stated, but also within General Synod as well. Because, you know, we sit here and go, how can you vote on these things with a good conscience without seeing the detail? And of course, this got into the national press, but just a headline from the Telegraph. And this is now the the, the trajectory and the the fight that it is now in the media. The Telegraph's headline is rebel priests threaten to split Church of England over same sex blessings. Groups say they may have to create new parallel promises if go ahead is given for trial standalone services. We're not, in a sense, the rebels here. We are still holding to the orthodox teaching of Jesus passed down through the centuries by faithful people. We hold to the word of God. We're not rebelling against anything, but the, these headlines will not be helpful. But we have to engage with this. We have to speak truth through love. We have to say to people quite clearly why believe uh, that marriage cannot be, same sex marriages can't be blessed in the public square. It's, a, it's an opportunity to show the love of Jesus Christ, but the hope that Jesus gives us through his gospel. So not only are we um, having all these things that I've just said in the church and, and, and in the Anglican communion, but now in the public square, we are being labelled as rebel priests. There will be more to come on this, especially as we get to General Synod, and I will be here bringing you my thoughts on all of this. Music